Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online.
Welcome to CSIS Online. The way we bring you events is changing, but we'll still present live analysis and award-winning digital media from our Dracopolis Ideas Lab. All on your time, live or on demand. This is CSIS Online. Hi, I, I'm Dan Rundy. I'm a senior vice president here at CSIS. I hold the Schreier chair. 
I'm really pleased uh, to be hosting an event uh, with our friends at URC called uh, U.S. Foreign Assistance and the Global COVID-19 Response. Uh, the outbreak of the deadly coronavirus has, has caused widespread challenges throughout the world. It's claimed over 1.1 million lives and continues to send shocks to societies and economies worldwide. Developing nations are particularly hit uh, during the pandemic due to a lack of adequate health care, sanitation, water, and economic contingency resources. Many developing countries were facing strenuous economic and political circumstances before COVID-19 that are being further exacerbated by the pandemic. In such crisis times, there's a need for traditional donor countries to rise to the occasion and rethink the purpose of their foreign assistance programs. This is such a shock that it's gonna require a significant rethink. Um, developing donor countries, donor countries need to strategically expand developmental assistance to not only contain political and economic de degradation, but also provide countries the tools to rebuild economies that are resilient to future crises. We're gonna have more, unfortunately, we're gonna have future pandemics with funny names uh, unfortunately, like clockwork, partially because of globalization, urbanization, air, uh, increased air travel, and because of changes in humans' diet as we move up the development curve uh, and, um, and more animal husbandry with, with moving up, bump, people bumping up against animals, there's more chances for zoonotic transmission of, of these diseases. So we have got a lot of challenges on our hands. In the immediate future, uh, we need to be thinking about how we're going to deal with issues of contact tracing, testing, and once there's a vaccine, vaccine delivery. Currently, multiple governments and privately owned and, pharma and, and pharmaceutical companies are racing to get the first COVID-19 vaccine out as scientifically possible. With a rush order in place, it is expected that multiple vaccines will ultimately be approved, but none will be widely available to the public for 12 to 18 months. When available, it is likely that they may have different storage, transport, and inoculation requirements. I would add some of these, uh, these vaccines need really, really super cold, cold chains, like something like minus 70 degrees Fahrenheit. And, I, and how we're gonna figure that out is gonna be an, a, a technology and an engineering and logistics feat. Given the challenges involved and the absence of a vaccine, uh, the wait time should be spent by the development community, most importantly, and what needs to be done now. So masks, diagnostic, and contract tracing to minimize the impact of the pandemic and on making sure we have the logistics plans to deliver the vaccines if and when it's available. I'm really grateful that um, some old friends of mine uh, and some new friends of mine are here to help us really unpack this complex a set of challenges. I've, I've been arguing that COVID is an excel, a disruptor of economies and, and society, an accelerator of things like uh, digital transformation and a clarifier, I think, of some geostrategic challenges that we have, among many other things. Um, I'm really grateful to have Dennis Carroll, who many of you know, he's a globally renowned pandemic expert and is currently uh, the senior advisor for global health security at URC. Dennis previously served as the director of the USAID, USAID's Pandemic, Influenza, and Other Emerging Threats Unit. Um, he's someone widely respected in the global health field. Uh, Maureen Choquette is with us. Maureen is the Senior Deputy Assistant Administrator for the Bureau of Policy, Planning, and Learning. In that role, she oversees PPL's Learning Evaluation and Research Office, uh, the Strategic and Program Planning Office, and the Program Office. Prior to joining PPL, Maureen, represent USAID as a senior development advisor at the US Africa Command in Germany. Um, she's had a wonderful career uh, in government. She was a mission director in Kosovo and um, is someone I've also known like Dennis for, um, for my time at AID and I respect both of them so, so much. I really appreciate both of them being here. John Parker is the director of Tetratex Environment and Natural Resources Sector. I really appreciate John being here, um, we're gonna, um, he has um, had a really interesting career at the intersection of the environment, natural resources and global development. 
And I think he's going to be able to help us because I think it's it's quite important that we don't, I'd like to like not do this again. So my goal is like not to be sitting at five years from now doing another basement stay for, for 12 months. And so I think it's very important that John is here to talk about some of the ways in which we can manage and prevent and get ahead of this because otherwise we're going to do this again in five years and I'm really not up for doing this again in five years. So uh, let me start with Dennis. Um, Dennis, we're we're now 10 months into the COVID-19 pandemic, entering the winter season with record-breaking surges in reported cases. Uh, was this situation of both the surge and lockdowns, were these inevitable? Well, Dan, first off, thank you uh, for the opportunity to participate in this discussion and uh, look forward to it. It's going to be very, very fun, I think, uh, in a very unfun time, uh, obviously. Um, look, the current surge was more than predictable. I mean, you know, we've been saying since the spring, in all likelihood, this respiratory virus um, really favored cold, dry weather. And this is the period of time we're going into it. What was uncertain was how well it would sustain itself over the summer months. But now that we're in October and moving into what is the ideal seasonal pattern for this particular virus, we're looking at the very beginning of what uh, in all likelihood will be a very brutal um, cold period for us as this virus finds its natural home. So the surge was more than predictable. The, what we're watching across Europe right now and beginning to anticipate here in the United States is a reassertion of um, these really stringent lockdown um, measures. And the truth of the matter is those were not inevitable. Um, we, if we go back to the spring and we talked about flattening the curve, doing the lockdowns, all of that was because we did not really have a comprehensive toolbox and we didn't really understand the virus as well as we needed to. And those were really emergency measures to protect the health system um, to ensure that those normative services that the health system provides were not compromised by this pandemic. But it meant it was a time, it gave us a, a period of time to prepare for what was the inevitable winter surge. And that preparation meant that we really had to step up um, both nationally and globally, uh, the making available what we know are the critical tools to be able to really stop this virus and control it. And that is readily available rapid diagnostics linked to contact tracing. Um, that Think of it in military terms. This is the core intelligence that tells you where your enemy is. The virus is our enemy. And lockdowns are a blunt instrument. When you don't really have an understanding of where the virus is, you have to shut down everything. Diagnostics and contact tracing tell us where it is and it allows us to be much more surgical. Unfortunately, we're largely dealing with the same technologies that we had six months ago. We did not have a operation warp speed for diagnostics. It was not the US government stepping forward and really incentivizing, um, making available the equivalent of an early pregnancy test that every household could have available and a, a really significant investment in the ability to utilize, utilize that information for contact tracing. It's all about knowing where the virus is, isolate it and eliminate it. And these lockdowns were not inevitable and we are now paying the price for not having done the work that should have been done. And I say that because this virus is still gonna be around for the foreseeable future. We lost time in the past. We still are going to be faced with this virus for many, many, many months as we go forward. So we need to take these steps to really make the kind of investment that incentivizes the diagnostic industry to really generate the kind of tools that would make us smarter, more insightful, strategic, and surgical in our response to this virus. Okay, on that happy note, can I start handing out virtual shots of whiskey? Is it not? Is it too early to start doing it? On that happy note, oh my God! But I, I but Dennis, I totally agree with you. 
this issue of we need an operation warp speed on this issue. One of the things I'm taking away from this conversation already is we're going to need, I want to get something from each of the speakers of like takeaways we need to all think about as the development community. So it seems to me the Global Innovation Fund for Development or DIV or the, a, the AID Lab or Gates or the USG or a collection of, of, of players, Taiwan could do this, Japan could do this. We need to throw some money at put, uh, coming up with the early pregnancy test of diagnostics. We need to be throwing, we need to have like a grand challenges on that right now. Is that you agree with that? Absolutely. Okay. So the last time I saw you, Dennis, was at Andrew Natsios's Woodstock for pandemics. I've been twice. I'm not, I haven't been to all five, but I've been to, I've went to several of them. And I know you've been there too. I would describe you and Andrew Natsios and other folks as being the Cassandras of pandemics. I will, every time you speak about this, I always listen because I, I consider what you have to say on this stuff to have gospel truth. And I consider what Andrew Natsios has to say about these issues as gospel truth. You guys were talking about this five years ago saying this is coming. So, okay, so what, uh, now that we're all sitting in our basements, what is the lessons learned? What lessons, are there one or two deep thought lessons you can share with us out of this, out of the fact that we're having to sit in our basements? And you've talked about some, but is there any other thing you want to share with this audience? Well, there are two. If anything, you know, there was nothing surprising about this virus per se. I mean, there's really unusual things about this virus, but its emergence and spread was not a surprise. Um, as you note, we've been saying it's not a question of if, it's a question of when. And let's be clear, this is not the end of the story. Um, these viruses are no longer black swan events. Population pressures more than anything else are making this more and more part of our natural landscape. So this is an urbanization, urbanization, airplane flights, changes in diet, changes our diet. This is just part of the, the price we pay for modernity. Exactly, and John will talk more about this, but yeah, the truth of the matter it. is, um, we need to be prepared. This is part of the world we live in, one. And two, probably the single biggest failure globally in responding to this um, event has been the <laughs> total collapse of the global networks, the global partnerships um, that have brought us together in the past. This is a global event, not just health event. It's a global uh, economic event is a global social security event. And we've acted as a fragmented sort of national driven agendas around the world, in Europe, in North America, across the board. And if anything, the take home lesson is we need to recommit ourselves to understanding global events require global responses. This is not every country for themselves. Europe. United States were all performing as if we never had the partnerships that really drove global coordination for the Ebola epidemic in 2014, the H1N1 pandemic, um, the avian influenza. All of these were you know, dealt with as a global, globally coordinated response. As we go forward, we need to say, recognize our Achilles heel right now is not the virus, it's us and us in this case is not acting as a global community to deal with a global threat, period. Thanks, Dennis. Maureen, I'm so glad you're here. Uh, there not only is the COVID challenge to some of what Dennis was saying about this is not a just a health event, this is a global event. And I know that AID is looking at this as a multi-dimensional challenge you all have just gone through a very extensive over the horizon exercise. I'm hoping you might share a little bit about some of the takeaways of that um, and some of how AID is thinking about this from multiple dimensions. I'm so glad you're here. Well, thanks so much, Dan, really appreciate it. And thanks to CSIS for hosting this. Uh, I'm really excited to be here also and talk about over the horizon. Uh, we launched our, the findings of our review this week, so this couldn't be more timely. So thank you so much for that. Um, so let me um, start off by reiterating exactly what everyone here has said already. Uh, the COVID-19 pandemic is really unlike any other crisis in recent history, and it has far reaching geopolitical implications. It's infected the entire world with devastating impacts that extend far beyond a public health emergency. And we know it's likely to impact our world for years to come in ways that we cannot yet predict. So the first and foremost uh, thing is that we need to have humility as we're looking at this. 
uh, we do not have all the answers or all the solutions. But at USAID, we realized that we need to be prepared. So we launched the Over the Horizon Review in June, uh, the results of which, as I mentioned, Acting Administrator Barsa announced this week. Over the Horizon was a data-driven, evidence-based strategic review that allowed us to think critically about how we can continue to meet our mission in the medium to long term. We benefited from significant input from across USAID staff and external partners. The team engaged missions in every region to integrate our field perspective, which is so critical. Uh, externally, we met with 75 different organizations, including implementers, think tanks, academics, and other partners. And we analyzed over 200 data sources that were reviewed and analyzed during this process. And so why we clearly do not have all the answers and solutions, some key trends emerge from this data. First, COVID-19 creates a new national security imperative. This is a complex crisis with far reaching geopolitical implications and a serious challenge to the international rules-based order. It shows definitively what we all know that security and prosperity at home are linked to the challenges abroad and our response to them. And this is certainly a health crisis unprecedented in, in scale, the trajectory of which remains uncertain, but we know it's likely to have impacts in countries and regions differently and it's making the health challenges worse. Uh, for example, more than 117 million children are at risk of missing measles vaccines, uh, which is just devastating. And so while we all know that it is a health crisis as we're, we were already talking about, it's so much more. The severe shocks to the economy and societies around the world are just devastating. Uh, it's impeding the movement of people, the capital and information and it's devastating government budgets around the world. And it's created the conditions for debt and banking crisis. And while digital transformation has dr accelerated dramatically over the last few months, it also carries the risk of deepening the digital divide, which can prevent uh, access to online schooling, which we know is critical as we see millions of young people out of school during the time of the pandemic. There's also rising pressure on governance, democracy, and stability, driving an overall increase in fragility, which will lead to increased conflict. And we see in many countries around the world them experiencing exactly this. Increased political volatility, uh, increased corruption, increased dramatic backsliding, and social unrest and increased conflict. And we also see malign actors exploiting this growth uh, and they're trying to sow doubt in democratic governance and destabilize entire regions. And finally, the pandemic is leading to devastating impacts on households. Growing food insecurity and rising extreme poverty affects the poorest, most marginalized populations more than any others. Sadly, this year we could see 132 million people pushed into chronic food insecurity. The loss of education and basic health services will also set vulnerable groups back. And we're seeing rates of violence against women and, and girls grow around the world during the pandemic. The humanitarian and development nexus is shifting as a result of COVID-19 and USAID realized that we must prepare for the lasting changes to the global landscape. Um, so we know that we have a central role to play in responding to the crisis and its medium to long-term effects so we can continue to support partner countries on their journey to self-reliance. And through the Over the Horizon review, we believe that we're prepared to do that. So Maureen, uh, thank you. I'm so glad you're here and I'm so glad uh, that you're at AID. I, I totally agree with the findings of the Over the Horizon exercise. And I'm, I, I mean, it seems to me that um, the, the, the millions, hundreds of millions of people get thrown. We, we see a decade or more of, of loss of global progress on, on economic progress. The, the health impacts are obvious, but the mental health indicators, we talk about that in the United States, but I think the domestic violence numbers are shooting up. It's terrible. 
terrible loss of opportunity for children. It's like a, it could be a lost academic year for kids and all the things, whether they get meals there or, or they get shots, all that stuff. At the same time, I think there are, all of that is to say there's an enormous disturbance and a lot of horrible, horrible, horrible consequences. There are perhaps, I'm not gonna call them silver linings in this really big gray cloud that's over us, but I'm gonna call them opportunities maybe. It seems to me there's sort of several opportunities for AID. One is we're gonna see some kind of, regardless of what happens in the United States politically, I think we're gonna have some kind of partial economic divorce from China. And what I think that means is that we're gonna see supply, global supply chains drift away from China to places like Indonesia or Vietnam, Central America and Mexico, Brazil, Colombia. There's a once in a generation opportunity for some middle income countries that are partners of AID. But as you know, Maureen, they can't just copy paste the factory in Wuhan and put it in Jakarta or Guatemala City or Tegucigalpa. There's a whole bunch of stuff that goes with it. You gotta have a trade agreement. You gotta have rules of law, rule of law. You gotta have ports and airports and electricity and running water and mass transit and roads and a skilled workforce, et cetera. All of those things AID touches on. Is that something that AID is beginning to think about at different regional levels? So you're seeing this sort of tectonic shift in trade flows and beginning to think about how aid can enable some of that. Is that on your radar screen? Well, certainly it is. Um, and we've been, um, you know, we have the analysis that we've done, the landscape analysis has just been incredible. I mean, we have volumes of uh, research that the team has done. So they first did a landscape analysis, really identifying uh, the challenges. And then they, they went into scenario planning and they looked at a variety of uh, scenarios. And we had different teams that were looking at different scenarios. And then based on all of that, we came up with our strategic objectives. And I'll talk about that in a second. Um, and then, but then from that, um, we also um, looked at uh, focus countries where not only do they have the most need, but also, as you just said, opportunity. So we're trying to mesh uh, need and opportunity to make sure that we are uh, maintaining the gains that we've had. You know, we've had a lot of hard driven uh, development gains. We, we are trying really hard not to, to lose on that and then to build forward. Um, so maybe I could talk a little bit more about the strategic objectives in Over the Horizon, if that's okay. Yes, please. And just, just if I wanted to go look and visit, is there a website I could go to, to look at this <laughs> on the horizon? Absolutely. Thank you for the plug. Uh, so <laughs> we uh, just yesterday uploaded all of our uh, Over the Horizon documents onto our, um, our website, usaid.gov. If you go to the homepage, um, you'll, you'll see Over the Horizon documents right there. Um, and I'm just extremely proud of all the work that the team did. Um, it was led in PPL by our own Josh Kaufman, who's the head of our, our policy office. Very uh, gifted. He's, yes. he and your team are so gifted. I was so impressed with the team, Josh, but also there were several other people. Give a shout out to some of the people on your, on your team. Oh, well, Jennifer Arangio was key. Uh, she's she's a senior advisor to the administrator. Uh, she was key in driving the whole thing. Um, but we had a planning cell that was made up of uh, great minds from across the agency. And, and then we also had an executive steering committee that was all of our senior leadership really giving us steers and telling us if we were going in the right direction and, and how we should be looking at the uh, data that we were using. As I said, it was really critical to us that, that this all be data driven. Um, and it was just a, a wonderful collaborative experience. Um, so um, Chris Milligan, Chris Maloney, Ramsey Day, uh, were all, uh, as well as Jennifer, really uh, driving the executive steering committee. And then uh, Josh leading the, the team uh, on the planning cell was just phenomenal. So I'm so proud of them. Uh, it's been a great experience. So let me go into, uh, if you don't mind, I'll, I'll just jump uh, quickly into talking about what our strategic objectives were, because um, I think there was some confusion of like, how does this relate to the COVID task force? And so the task force was really looking at the immediate needs and the immediate response. Um, and then uh, we, we 
quickly recognize that this is gonna be with us for a long time and it's gonna change the landscape. So in June, um, the acting administrator um, called on us to start up this review to really look at the uh, medium and long-term impacts because you know, this is a national security and development crisis and it requires a new way of thinking and way of doing our work. Um, so why the task force was looking at the immediate, we're looking at the long-term on the over the horizon group. And so out of all of the uh, work that they did, it really culminated in a set of actionable recommendations working towards three strategic objectives. The first one is building resilience in fragile countries that are further weakened by COVID-19. The second is addressing backsliding on food security, education, and poverty reduction due to the pandemic. And third is strengthening public and private health systems and the, the global health system security that is strained by COVID-19. And then towards those three objectives, the team developed 32 recommendations, 16 of which are programmatic and technical priorities and then an additional 16 recommendations that are more operational in focus um, that are really going to help us towards um, achieving these goals. So I'll stop there, um, see what other questions you have. Okay, I've got one other one, which is um, I've been saying that there's been more e-commerce, more distance learning and more e-government in the last 30 weeks than in the last 30 years. And I would argue that in the next 15 years, that the, the broad, high speed broadband internet is the new electricity. And that if you wanna have a civilization, you need literacy, among other things. You need literacy, you need clean drinking water, you need toilets, uh, you need electricity, and now you're gonna need this. And so my view is either we're gonna solve this problem, the West is, the OECD countries are, or China's gonna solve this. But the demands from the global public, whether it's Africa, Latin America, Southeast Asia, anywhere in the world, urban center, un overlooked urban cores in the United States, rural America, this is just gonna be a have to have thing. How are you thinking about high speed access to, how do you think about this, the digital divide that you referenced earlier? Because I think that's part of this conversation, please Maureen. Well, that's gonna be um, really critical. So one of the recommendations is focused on enhancing our, our digital, um, uh, footprint and really working with, with the lab and the newly stood up DDI and others to make sure that we're addressing that. And it, that's going to impact a number of the sectors. As you mentioned, um, you know, it, this, is, this is gonna be critical. And with the, these opportunities, if we can't help provide access um, to, uh, to the internet and, and digital services, it's going to exasperate um, poverty. And, and we know that 132 million people are, are projected to, to go into uh, abject poverty. This is just devastating. Um, so we're really looking at that across each sector to see um, where we can have uh, those inputs, particularly in the focus countries. Um, you know, and, and I think this is gonna be critical both for economic growth working with small and medium enterprises in the agriculture sector, as well as through education, and, and really making sure that uh, the digital trans, uh, transformation, which has really been turbocharged by the pandemic, um, it, it, is, is, um, is going to be addressed. Maureen, thanks a lot. I'm so glad you're here and congratulations on this exercise. I think it's a really important contribution. I'm going to be posting it on my LinkedIn. We're going to be tweeting it out. So congratulations to Josh and the really fabulous team that we're working with you on this. It's a really important contribution. Thank you and congratulations. Oh, thanks so much, Dan. Okay, so John, thanks for being here. Um, yeah, everything I've learned about zoonotic transfer, I learned from Dennis Carroll and Andrew Natsios when I went to those pandemic Woodstocks that Andrew has been convening at, at Texas A&M, uh, like, you know, prophetically for the last five years. So, so John, thanks for being here. Can, if, if I said to you, could you explain to, to, to Earth people, what is zoonotic transfer and why does that matter to this conversation? Yeah, thanks, Stan. It's, it's a real 
pleasure to be uh, part of this panel and, and really great to hear the, the contributions and, and insights from Maureen and, and Dennis. And, and I think that the points and, and, and takeaways have, have, have thus far been, been, been excellent. And I think they'll, they'll complement well with, with what I'll raise in, in response to, to your, your questions. I also think I'll, I'll probably take a, a little bit of a, a different focus and, and perspective. And so in terms of zoonotic diseases, you know, I think as you think about the emergence and, and spread, it's, it's important to, to talk a little bit about some of the underlying and, and, and deep-seated drivers uh, of, of zoonotic diseases. And in this case, of course, the focus of, of the discussion is, is, is COVID-19. And, and I think to do so, um, you know, we need to think about the linkages between environmental degradation and, and, and human health and, and how in turn, you know, that, that has influenced in, in many ways the, the emergence of, of this pandemic and, and puts us at, in my opinion, continued risk for, for emerging infectious disease events uh, more broadly. And so, you know, related to that, I, I think when we, when we just discuss COVID, we, we rightfully so um, look at the issues principally through a, a public health perspective and, and also a, a response lens. And, and both of these are, of course, critically important and, and urgent, but I, but I think in terms of zoonotics, um, and emerging uh, pandemics to, to fundamentally think about long-term solutions and, and make sure, to your point, Dan, that this doesn't happen again. It's, it's really important to analyze and understand what, what created the conditions for, for the, the pandemic in the first place. So, you know, if you, if, you, if you consider drivers, I think the critical point here, and I can explain this further, uh, is that ecosystem degradation uh, and habitat loss uh, driven by population growth, uh, urbanization, uh, shifting dietary patterns have, have really made us vulnerable to, to an increasing rate and frequency of, of emerging, emerging zoonotic viruses and, and as a result, COVID. And so, you know, we know from COVID that, that the emergence and, and, and spread of these diseases, and these are events where viruses are transmitted from, from wildlife or, or animals to humans. These, of course, have devastating and, and, and far-reaching impacts as our you know, world has become increasingly globalized and, and interconnected. And of course, they're, they're, they're often uh, highly lethal. Um, and you know, I, I think to sort of describe that, that point a, a little bit further, and so everyone's sort of clear of, of, of these linkages, we, we know, of course, that the demands on, on natural resources are, are increasing uh, populations and, and population density continue to grow, uh, food, fiber, and, and energy demand in, in turn is, is of course rapidly increasing. You know, we know that the projections of the need to, to nearly double food production by 2050 to feed over uh, 9 billion people. And of course the related demand on, on land and, and water resources and ecosystem goods and services. And, and so as all of this plays out, what's happening is that land and ecosystems that had previously served as, as habitats for, for wildlife populations are now uh, increasingly used for, for agriculture and, and, and livestock production or to uh, accommodate growing human settlements and, and, and urban and, and, and peri-urban expansion. And so this, this issue of demographic change and, and growing pressure on, on habitats and, and biodiversity, it really creates conditions for wildlife that, that may serve as a, as a host or, or, or reservoir of, of zoonotic pathogens to increasingly come into contact with, with other animals or people. And so, you know, as habitats are, are fragmented, there are fewer places for wildlife to live and fewer food sources. So, so animals are finding food and shelter where, where people are now um, living. And so, you know, for example, we, we know that, that bat populations uh, which of course present significant risks as, as hosts of zoonotic viruses, they've increasingly set up in, in areas that are in, in closer proximity to, to human settlements. And, and that's just one example of, of greater human wildlife interactions uh, due to land use change and, and habitat loss. And, and all of this, of course, increases the risk of disease spread and in, in what is known as, as, as spillover when, when viruses jump from, from animals uh, to humans. Um, and just just a couple more more points, Dan, and, and then of course we can go to some other questions. I, you know, I, I, I want to bring up the issue of, of of wildlife trade. I mean, this is something that I think has been on, you know, all of our, our radars, and increasingly so with, with with COVID. And and you know, it's it's another 
manifestation of uh, environmental events that are that are increasing uh, risk of, of animal to human disease transmission. Um, this is due to the conditions it, it, it creates of close contact between wildlife and humans, uh, cross-border movement of, of species without, uh, in many cases, a, appropriate biosafety protocols or, or, or inspections. You know, in the case of illegal trade, it's often in, in poor transport conditions and outside regulated markets. And, and we've seen this, the scope and, and volume of, of wildlife trade grow and, and become increasingly interconnected and, and, and sophisticated with, with globalization. And of course, this presents even, even greater human health risks. And, and there's been a lot of focus on, on this issue in the context of COVID and, and whether the virus jumped from an animal host to, to humans and, and probably and wet markets. Right. Yeah, if you're uh, a betting man, is that what happened? So that so let's make sure everyone understands this, right? I mean, now first I have a really critical question. Is it zoonotic or zoonotic? Is that like potato potato? What is that? Zoonotic. 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 I like zoonotic. Is that kind of like saying like nuclear instead of nuclear? Do you know what I mean? Like I, I don't know. Anyways, look. I, I, I think Dennis is, is the expert, so I think you can yeah, I'm gonna have to ask Dennis to tell us what we do about that. I, I I'm gonna come back to Dennis in a minute because I have a big question for Dennis, but let me, I just want to press on this, John, because I think it's really important that people understand, like, why, why did we have John, who's a zoonotic expert, I'm going to, I'm going to keep saying zoonotic until Dennis tells me I, he takes my toy away and says I can't say zoonotic anymore, but it seems to me, like, why did we have an environmental development person on this conversation, and so it's really important people understand this, and I think you've spoken to it, but let me just, just put two, a super fine point on this, the reason we're all sitting in our basements is highly likely because some animal had COVID and then the disease jumped from an animal to a person, right? Is that right, John? That highly likely would happen? Exactly. And, and I think, you know, a key point here, Dan, is that, you know, if you look at recent emerging infectious disease events and, and you know, not just COVID, but, but you know, almost all recent outbreaks uh, and, and, and pandemics, the overwhelming majority of these originate in, in wildlife. Um, in other words, COVID's not the first outbreak with its origins in, in wildlife. It, it follows um, Ebola, uh, Nipah virus, SARS, SARS and, 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 and many others. And, and, and you know, I think Dennis made this this point, and it's it's a really important one. We 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 knew this before COVID, uh, but it's now it's because common. this has happened clear. before. We've had five of these in the last twenty years. Exactly. Because, so, John, just so I'm just being real, I'm a real linear, simple guy. Okay. So we have a lot more aviation it means a lot more people together. We got a lot more urbanization. There's now more than fifty percent of the world lives in cities, so they're bumping up against each other. And if you move up, there's been a major global progress in global development. And when I move up the development curve, I eat less cassava and I want more pork. I eat less rice and I want more chicken. I eat less beans and I want more steak, right? Is that all correct? There's changes yeah, in human that, diet, is that correct? That's, that's absolutely correct. But at the same time, you know, you, you still have relatively low productivity in, in, in agriculture, you know, areas where are sort of hot spots of, of zoonotic disease emergence where, you know, there continues to be significant, significant expansion of, of agriculture. And of course, you know, uh, expansion of secondary towns and, and, and urban. Right. We, expand and all that that. Is we expand the amount of land being, we cut down trees, we're farming land or there's, we're raising cattle in larger chunks of, of the world, of the land mass. There's also sort of changes and disruptions in the ecosystem doing that. Or when we cut down trees to build a house as we kind of expand out the suburbs of the urban or semi-urban or peri-urban, we're also creating disturbances in the force in the environment. So John, if I use the term one health, what is one health? Cause that's, that's a thing in your world, right? What is One Health, John? Yeah, I mean, I, you know, this is a, a really important, you know, point and, and One Health is essentially recognizing that, that human, animal and, and ecosystem health are, are all interdependent. I mean, that's, I'd say the fundamental 
tenet of, of the One Health concept. And, you know, again, One Health is something that, that has been on the agenda and, and recognized as, as a priority for, for, for quite some time. Um, and, and now, of course, um, has been really, I'd say, reinvigorated uh, due, due to the COVID situation. Um, but it, it has to be, you know, prioritized. We need to continue. Okay. So, to so, make so, John, are you up for sitting in a basement again in five years' time for 18 months? I'm like not up I, for I, that. I hope, I hope not. I hope not. You're not up for that either, right? Yes. Okay. So if, if no one's, I'm going to ask, we could have a little survey. Is anyone up for doing this five years from now for the next funny name disease and sit in our basements and zoom at each other for, for, for 18 months while we wait till we find another vaccine? If we don't want to do this again, and I'm, I'm up for not doing this again, then we got to deal with this one health stuff. All this, all this stuff, zoonotic diseases means if we don't deal with zoonotic diseases, we're sitting in our basements again in five years time. That's what this means. That's why we had John on this conversation. Okay, so John, there's a thing called a wet market. What's a wet market and are wet markets a good thing or a bad thing? Should we outlaw wet markets? And why, why am I raising that in this discussion? You know, well, you're raising it because of course, you know, the, the, the discussion of, of the sort of spillover from um, in the context of COVID from, from animals to, to humans, you know, the, 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 the location where this was uh, identified as, as Wuhan and, and discussion about wet markets is, is sort of the, the source. I mean, I think, I think the, the, the response to that is a bit more nuanced. I mean, wet markets are essentially live, uh, you know, animal markets also, you know, they, they, there can be sale of all kinds of goods and services and inherently they aren't, they, they don't necessarily um, present issues, but they present risks. And I, you know, I think, you know, as it goes to wet markets and, and the issue of, of wildlife trade, it's not as simple as as banning wildlife trade. I mean, there's a whole set of, um, you know, unintended consequences that I think, um, you know, present themselves as, as, a, as a result of that. So, I, you know, I think that we need to focus on, you know, regulations and, and, and enforcement. And, that, and that's something AID could do, right, John? I mean, this is something, yep. this is right up AID's alley. So One Health, managing ecosystems, supporting, um, managing forests, uh, planning, urban planning, super non-glamorous stuff, but really important stuff to make sure that you have development or the kinds of things you're describing, like regulating wet markets or going after and, and dealing with issues around illegal animal trade. These are all things where there's an undergird of stuff that AID and AID's ecosystem of partners do to respond to that challenge. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. So, okay. So you're not anti wet markets in the sense that we shouldn't outlaw wet markets, but we need to sure as hell throw a lot of regular, we need to regulate the hell out of them so we don't have this again. That's yeah. I mean, you know, it, it, the regulations and enforcement piece is really fundamental in terms of uh, so just, wildlife just trade. Just so issues. everyone understands, I think everyone in our viewing audience knows this, but the, 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 ostensible thing that happened was either there's either one or two or several things happen either a young person at the weapons lab didn't wash their hands properly for 25 seconds after they left the weapons lab in Wuhan or you know this is the various theories another one is that there was somebody had a, a, a an infected animal at the wet market and, the, and we can have different discussions about how that infected animal showed up at the wet market, but somehow somebody, there was a tran zoonotic transfer from a diseased animal at the wet market and got somebody in Wuhan and that person then spread it, right? Isn't that in essence, though, I mean, I'm not gonna ask you to comment on all the theories, but the reason we're having this conversation about zoonotic transfer and we're having conversations about wet markets is because the ostensible theory about what happened is, is something like that happened and so now, so when we talk about things like peri-urban stuff or changes in, in, in human diet or wet markets, it all has to do with the fact that the reason that all comes up then we ask her, why are we sitting in our basements zooming at each other is because of that. Is that right? That's right, Dan. Yeah. So I'm not up for doing this again in five years. So it seems to me that what John is saying is something we really need to get a handle on because we have to get ahead of this in the future. We need to think in security terms about environmental security as a form of national security. 
and that we need to think about environmental health when we think about global health, right? That These are the kinds of concepts that you're trying to tell us. Is that right, John? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, you know, again, getting back to the, 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 the One Health is, is an important priority. You know, it, it, it's, it's really critical that we no longer treat uh, environmental issues and environmental programming is, is separate from, from separate health. Separate from everything health else. We need, to, we need to incorporate environmental security into national security. You're seeing this in the ocean space because of great power competition. You're seeing this in what's called IUU fishing. Guess what? We now need to look at this issue of One Health as part of a national security thing. Because I, I like you, John, but I don't want to Zoom at you again in my basement five years. When we reconvene five years from now, I don't want to do this again with you. I want to do this at CSIS for all like, nor like normal times. And I want... You guys are all welcome. We'll all sit on a panel and I'll shake your hand and, you know, and we can, you know, we can fight over the, you know, the, the coffee bar and not be freaked out and feel like we're going to get a disease or something. I, I don't like this sitting in my basement. So I'm not up for this again. Okay. It's ridiculous. So what John is saying, we got to deal with, this is really, really important. It's not a sidebar. Nice to have. This is an existential set of issues that John's putting on the table. Okay, so Dennis, I got one question for you and I got to get some questions from the audience. Okay, Dennis, I think there's been an enormous amount of energy, understandably, about getting a vaccine for the state of Georgia, the state of Indiana, and the state of Minnesota. But if we ever want to have globalization again, someone's going to have to lead a coalition and willing to make sure that the country of Georgia, the country of um, Indonesia, and the country of Mali, meaning the whole world gets access to vaccines. So we're gonna have vaccines, God willing, in the next 30, 60, 90, 120 days. And there's been a lot of energy in this country about just making sure that we get it for the, in the United States. And I understand that. But if you ever wanna go on to a wedding in Spain, you wanna go backpacking in Peru, you wanna move that factory from Wuhan to Indonesia, your son wants to go do a term and study, or your daughter wants to go study in Ghana, we're gonna to have to deal with this as a global challenge to your point earlier. So what's it gonna take and how are we gonna deal with that? Cause I don't think we, I've heard enough about how we're gonna get a global response to ensuring that every single person in the world, all 8 billion people are gonna to have to get vaccinated at least once. Where are we with that? And what needs to happen on that? Because I've heard a lot about Indiana, Georgia and Minnesota. I haven't heard enough about Georgia, the country Mali in Indonesia. Dennis. Dan, thank you. First off, this is an extraordinarily important point. It, it again reflects the fact that COVID-19 is a global event and we can't solve it within our borders if we don't solve it with outside our borders at the same time. That shared vulnerability is something we have to acknowledge. And this is not about uh, being a good citizen. It is our interest we need to understand are incredibly interlinked with the well-being of populations around the world. So as we think about how we really maximize the value of the vaccines as they come along, um, we need to understand that it's an absolutely important that there is a really strongly coordinated effort to ensure availability of the vaccine um, as maximally possible across the world. And there are efforts in that direction already. There is a global uh, partnership called COVAX, that, which is being led by uh, WHO, and it's been joined by uh, member states from around uh, the world to commit themselves to making sure that as these vaccines come uh, available, that there will be a coordinated effort to ensure equitable access and distribution um, of the vaccine. Sadly, the United States is not part of that discussion. Um, we've so, so Dennis, so, so Dennis so if you said, if you wanted to have, if you, one of the things the Trump administration said, it's very important to have burden sharing. And one of the things they talk about is burden sharing. And I understand why they would say, we care about making sure that the United States isn't being a sucker and only and covering all the stuff. That's a way to frame it. I'm not sure that's the way I would frame it, but it's a way to frame it. And so what you would say is we need to have burden sharing. So one way of having burden sharing is a collective action vehicle like a COVAX, right? right. So 
explain. So if what would be the advantages of the United? Let's tell if you were making the case to the National Security Advisor of the United States, put aside put aside the global health and talk about why is it the American advantage to join COVAX? Why is that a good thing? Right. We've already said that um, a major impact of this pandemic is the economic disruption uh, around the world. Our own economy uh, has seriously been impacted, but we look elsewhere in the world and as we've, we see equal uh, impact. And we know that if we're going to revitalize our, um, our own economies, it's very uh, interconnected to the economies elsewhere in the world. Um, you've mentioned it over and over, Dan. This is a, a globalized uh, world that we live in. And part of stabilizing the economic uh, dynamics is making sure that people are healthy. And in this case, uh, the, the vaccine is going to be a critical tool towards ensuring that health, um, global health. So if we want our own can, we, we, our ec economy is not um, driven by what happens within our borders. It's driven by the shared dynamics that happens around the world. And unless we stabilize the global economies, our own economy will continue to tank. So right. the vaccine is a critical tool not the only tool, but it's a critical tool towards um, moving towards some kind of economic stability. Thank, okay, Dan, so, that, so my view is, is if I go to certain audiences, or let me call them foreign aid skeptical, and I start talking about health system strengthening and Sierra Leone, they're gonna throw me out of their office. But if I say to them, hey, when we manage COVID, do you want six people, six people showing up sick with COVID, showing up at Newark Airport, they're gonna say, no, I don't want that. Do you want us all sitting in basements again? They'll say, no, I don't want that. And so if you don't want, if you don't want to have another one of these, we're all sitting in our basements doing Zoom in 18 months, then we're going to have to have every single person in the world vaccinated. Otherwise, we're going to have outbreaks and it's going to come to our shores. Is that right, Dennis? Absolutely. Look, again, um, the planet isn't that big. And the fact of the matter is um, we are int intimately connected to every other uh, economy on this planet. And Unless, you know, and these economies, as we've seen now with COVID-19, are incredibly dependent on uh, the health of their population. COVID has shown that when you uh, strike at the health of a population, you immediately impact on the economic and social stability of that um, community. You know, the thing that I've heard across the three panelists, that Maureen, I'll bring you into this, is interdependence. So Maureen, let me bring you into this. So I just wanted to uh, interject, um, be, uh, and I agree, um, you know, with everything that's been said. So one of our uh, recommendations, and I mentioned that we had 32 of them, is to promote access to a safe and licensed vaccine because it's going to be really critical, as you, you've been talking about, um, that it, it's available worldwide, but our most vulnerable populations need access to it. So that's something that is very high on our radar. And we're gonna be making sure that we're um, using um, our, our voice in the development community to make sure that um, we're, we'll, we're continuing to promote access, particularly for the most vulnerable groups. Maureen, I've gotten some questions from the audience. Oh, you had something else you wanna say? Go ahead. No, please go right ahead. Okay, sorry. So the inter there's a question from the audience for you. The international community has made spectacular gains over the last few decades with countries like India lifting hundreds of millions out of poverty. How is USAID, you know, COVID uh, puts this at risk. How is USAID responding to the setbacks in global development that COVID is, is producing? Well, that's, that's the challenge, right? Um, so this is something that we've been taking uh, a, a real look at. And as I mentioned early, we wanna make sure that we're protecting our hard won gains. That's one of the strategic principles that runs across everything that we've been doing uh, because reversal of development gains um, is going to be a tremendous setback. And so our goal has been operating in a world altered by COVID is to get them back on track. Um, and so we did design these strategic objectives towards um, mitigating those losses, opening new opportunities for inclusion and growth, 
And we're going to continue to emphasize our humanitarian response to immediate needs. Um, and we certainly know we can't do this alone. So we're looking to leverage public and private sector resources uh, at, to mitigate the, mitigate the increases to poverty and chronic hunger, which I mentioned. Uh, we're going to continue to promote the participation of the, and leadership of women and youth. Uh, youth are really critical. Um, and we are, as I mentioned earlier, we're going to reorient assistance towards digital development because we think that's going to lead to greater inclusion, access, and efficiency in the countries. Um, and you know, as as we look at just these the big challenges, we're really trying to make sure that we're working with civil society organizations and everyone else um, to to continue to make sure that that we aren't leaving anyone behind. And I, I do wanna mention, um, I, I can't have an event without mentioning our foreign service nationals. Um, so I, because they have been critical as we, we saw our staff um, being evacuated from countries, uh, they remained there. We tried to make sure that they had the tools to work from home because not everyone did. And so, uh, they were so critical to continuing our development gains uh, through this. Uh, we're working throughout the agency to make sure that we can enhance their role going forward. And we think that's a, a critical part of our growth as an agency. Thanks, Maureen. Let me, I want to let, I'm going to each of you to do parting thoughts. I think this has been a really interesting conversation. I'm going to start with John. So John, if you were going to give me sort of a one minute set of parting thoughts about about COVID and, and, and let me start with you and then I'll go to um, Maureen and I'll go to Dennis. So go ahead, John. Yeah, so thanks, thanks, Dan. I, I mean, I think that that one really important point to make and we've, we've touched on it a bit um, and I, I think it's a painful lesson that, that we've hopefully taken away from this pandemic, particularly as we think about foreign assistance priorities that moving forward, we, we really need to take a proactive approach rather than, than a reactive one and, and address the threat head on at, at its source. And, and that means putting in place, you know, the, the measures necessary to reduce the emergence and, and spread of these, these viruses and the risk of a, a future pandemic. And so, you know, the, the response to COVID and, and these essential interventions, these are of course incredibly important, but at the same time, we can't lose focus on the importance of, of equally investing in preparedness and, and prevention programming that, that will better position us to prevent uh, these outbreaks in the future. And so that, you know, requires us to focus on better detecting and improving surveillance of emerging zoonotic viruses and, and critical hotspots, addressing the underlying drivers that we've talked about, placing an emphasis on, on One Health programming, um, and, and raising awareness and interventions that, that really incentivize behavior change at all levels and particularly at the local level. And just, you know, finally, I think without this approach and these types of investments, which in many ways require a shift in our current programmatic approach will, in my opinion, continue to remain vulnerable to similar outbreaks in the future. Okay, so I, my tweet is gonna be like, I'm not up for doing, sitting in my basement five years from now with John, Dennis and Maureen. I'd like to all have you guys out in like the real world. So if you don't wanna, if, if you guys don't, if everybody doesn't wanna sit in their basements again and zoom at each other for another 18 month stint while we ride out the next one of these, then we're gonna have to deal with the issues John is talking about in a much more strategic way. We can't have the environmental stuff off in the corner. We have to see environmental issues as part of national security. We have to incorporate environmental issues into how we think about uh, health. And we're gonna have to get ahead of the, you know, people like Dennis and Andrew Nazi have been talking about this for a long time, prophetically. I, I'd like us to like listen to what they're saying and people like what John's saying, as opposed to us like having another think tank discussion five years around saying we need to do it. We just need to do it. So John, thanks for being there. I really appreciate it. Uh, Maureen. Okay, well, th thanks, Dan. Um, so building on that, that we need to be prepared so we're not doing this again. Uh, that's why I'm so thrilled that one of the recommendations we had was the standing up of a strategic foresight unit. It'll be um, in PPL, um, my home bureau. And we're really gonna be um, looking at the, continuing the analysis we, we've been doing with a focus on the future. So we can prepare for not only what's right in front of us, but what's coming next. Um, I, I think that's gonna be critical to our 
our success and our ability to be able to respond. Uh, because, you know, as, as we've said throughout this entire conversation, you know, the world is, is, is global, everyone is interconnected. If anyone had any doubt about that, uh, COVID has certainly dispelled them of that. And another thing uh, that I think uh, this has dispelled everyone is not only is environmental security part of national security, you know, we're old timers, we remember the debates about is development really part of national security? Uh, that ship has sailed. Um, there, is, there is no um, more unfortunate um, but indicator of that, that this is true than, than COVID. And so, you know, development is a key part of our national security. And, and we need to be prepared to take us forward. So um, that's what we're hoping that Over the Horizon has been able to do for us. We, we can't do this alone. We're interconnected. This is, we want to solve COVID. The, the solution, the, there's a, the, solu the solution set is in the development toolkit to COVID, right? That's correct. And, but as you said, we can't do it alone. It's, it's, a, it's a whole global, it's, it's, it's the countries that we work with. It's the private sector. Uh, it, it's everyone in the public sector. It's everyone. Yeah. Okay. Dennis, take us home. Well, I want to go back to the dark cloud silver lining um, sort of metaphor you were working with earlier, Dan. And to remind everyone that the fact what is happening in the United States is not necessarily what's happening everywhere. And it's worth pointing out that there is uh, actually a legacy of success. The work that USAID Centers for Disease Control uh, have done over the years that we have spent the last two decades working with countries around the world to help them prepare for events like this. And we work with them to develop a playbook. How would they respond in an event like this? And quite frankly, that playbook was also um, generated here within our own country. The fact of the matter is you can look at countries like South Korea, you can look at countries like Vietnam, you can look at countries like Thailand, that in fact account for almost two thirds of the United States population and they have fewer than 1000 deaths. And you have to ask yourself, what's different about those countries than us? And the difference is that they use their playbooks that we had worked with them on. And there, there is an excellent documentary that the New York Times just released a couple of days ago. It's called How America um, you know, uh, Supported Successfully the Coronavirus Response Around the World. And it's a 15 minute video. Go in and take a look at it because it speaks really profoundly about how we're not as vulnerable as we think we are. The fact of the matter is we have the tools and we have the knowledge, we have the ability to really bring these events under control, but it requires leadership and it requires the execution of the playbooks that are out there. So I would encourage you to take a look at it because it reminds us that we don't have to be victims. There will be other events. And I agree with everything that John said we need to be more proactive. We can prevent, and there's no excuse for there ever being a future pandemic or even an epidemic. Those are preventable. We know how to prevent them. And it is about taking this much more aggressive One Health approach. But ultimately, if these events do happen, there are things we can do to minimize their impact. And Thailand, Vietnam, South Korea, Taiwan, even Japan are excellent examples of what we can do to respond to these threats. We don't have to hunker down into our basements. There are options that have proven to be successful. So as we go forward and we go forward into the coming months of what will be a very challenging COVID winter, there are clear examples that if we utilize the tools that we have helped other countries develop and we practice what we preach, we can be as successful as Thailand, as Vietnam, as South Korea, as uh, uh, Japan. So the silver lining is we can be successful. We don't have to be victims. What we need, however, is leadership. 
Dennis. So Dennis. go to the New York Times video. It's a good one. And I'm not, um, unfortunately, I'm in it. So I'm not trying to sort of <laughs> advertise myself. Um, but it is, I think, Americans need to understand that we've made a profound contribution by way of our foreign assistance programs, USAID, Centers for Disease Control. And we need to import some of the things we've exported. Got it. That's that's a really good. This is it's so development's a two way street, and we actually need to learn, learn, relearn lessons. We we helped other folks to learn, and now they're going to teach us. Is is one of the takeaways? Exactly right. So take a look at the video. It's a good one. Dennis, Marine, John, thank you all for doing this. Thank you, URC. Uh, we got a big agenda. We've got to have the United States going to have its hands full after this election. Um, we are interdependent world and we're going to have to, we're going to solve this, but it's going to take a while. It's going to, we can't do this alone. We're going to have to work with a whole bunch of actors, uh, but we're going to have to partner and it also is going to require leadership. Thanks everybody. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Ciao. Thank you.